So my name is Rory Barnes. I am an astronomer and astrobiologist at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. Uh, my background is primarily in orbital dynamics. I started as an astronomer. Uh, I got my PhD here at the University of Washington, working on the dynamics of extrasolar planets as well as the formation of the Earth. <clears throat> uh, from here, I went on to uh, the University of Arizona's Planetary Science Dep Department, where I learned a lot more about the planets in our solar system, and I'm now back here at the University of Washington, where I'm in both the astronomy and the astrobiology programs. And I am here today to discuss results uh, regarding the discovery of three potentially habitable planets orbiting the star Gliese 667c. This is a star about 22 light years from the Earth. It is an M dwarf, meaning it is at about a third the mass of our sun, so quite a different uh, star than our sun. Uh, but what we found most intriguing about this was that we discovered three planets with masses between about two and eight or maybe nine Earth masses that are all orbiting within this star's habitable zone. So I am now going to open the floor up for questions. If anybody has any questions about these discoveries, how we found them, what we might think they might be like, I'll be happy to answer them. So a question from Sanjoy is, how did we find the planets? And that's uh, certainly a good place to start. We discovered these planets through the radial velocity method, as astronomers like to call them. This means that we observed the motion of the star in the sky. We did not actually see the planets directly. They are too small and too faint to be able to see from the Earth. But what we are able to see is their effect on the host star. Uh, the gravitational pull of these planets, although quite weak, is actually strong enough that we can detect the movement of the star in the sky. And as we monitor the, the motion and the velocity of this star with time, we can determine if its motion is consistent with the presence of a planet that is tugging on it. And in this case, we we're actually able to determine that there were six planets tugging on this star and all of the tuggings were consistent with the laws of physics and so we were able to back out what the properties of these planets were that were tugging on it. And what we found was that three of these planets have masses that are at least uh, two or four times the mass of the Earth and that they have orbits that are consistent with the, the habitable zone. So they were found through the radial velocity method which is just a, a way to watch the, the star move around in space. So an, another question from Sanjoy, what other methods do astronomers have? There's actually a handful of, of ways to discover extrasolar planets. Uh, the radial velocity method is sort of the, uh, the first method that really worked out well to discover uh, exoplanets. Perhaps the, the most famous method nowadays, made famous by the Kepler spacecraft, is the transit method. It, the transit method is the discovery of exoplanets by the the passage of the star, or excuse me, the passage of the planet in between the star and the Earth. Uh, when that happens, the, some of the light from the star is blocked, and so if you were to monitor the brightness of a star with time, you would actually see the, the star get periodically a little bit dimmer. And it's not that the star is, is changing, it's actually that there is this planet crossing in front of the, uh, the star, this planet crossing in front of the star, and that's blocking some of the light. So that's how the Kepler spacecraft works. Um, this also being done from the ground, and so that is now the most successful method to discover exoplanets. There are also some more, um, more methods. They're not quite as uh, successful at this point, but they are going to be uh, useful in the future. Uh, the one method that has discovered several planets is called microlensing. Uh, this is actually very cool. It uses the uh, general relativistic effect of stars to sort of observe the brightening of, of planets that are nearby it. Um, it's, I'm not going to go into too much detail on that. It's a rather complicated method, but it's, a, it's very cool. And it's amazing that you can use general relativity to discover planets, and you can. Um, another method that is going to become, I think, the next hot uh, method to discover exoplanets is something called astrometry. Astrometry is the actual me measuring the position of stars in the sky. And this was actually the first method that was proposed to discover an exoplanet. 
uh, and it is basically where it, it's kind of a, similar to the radio velocity method in that you're actually watching the star move as a result of planets pulling on it and instead of watching uh, the star move backwards and forward toward the uh, the earth instead what you watch is this the, the star move around in the sky due to the, this, the planets pulling onto it and the reason why I think that that's going to be a, a prominent method in the future is because the Europeans are going to be launching a spacecraft called Gaia uh, I think it either this year or next year I guess I mean, if it's this year it might very well be next year uh, and uh, that that's going to do a very good job of discovering um, exoplanets in through this ast astrometric method and so there's there's a lot of different ways we can find these exoplanets uh, so far radio velocity and transit methods are, are the two most successful at, at, at finding them all right so uh, the next question is am I involved with exoplanet atmosphere detection and not really uh, my primary my I'm primarily interested in uh, discovering exoplanets, just their orbits and their masses, as well as uh, how to interpret their um, their properties after they are discovered. So, um, certainly, their discovery and their their properties that we can discern from just the orbits and the masses tells us a lot about what to expect from their atmospheres. Uh, but I am not really involved in trying to determine what their atmospheres are made of, and you know. And, and detecting them. Um, that's going to happen in the near future. Uh, we are going to, the James Webb Space Telescope, when it launches, might have the potential to actually uh, measure these and detect these atmospheres of, of terrestrial exoplanets. Of course, we are detecting the atmospheres of gas giants today. So, uh, the next question is, which method, RV versus transit, can detect the smallest planets? That's a great question because it's kind of a tie. Um, you know, the so far the uh, the transit method has has done the best. It's discovered something about the size of Mercury, uh, that or and that was with Kepler. That was uh, discovering that was it was discovering one of these planets through the transit method, orbiting a, a rather distant star that's uh, about like, the size of the Sun. It's a very hot planet. Um, Mercury would be a chilly place compared to the one that the Kepler the Kepler Space Telescope discovered. But um, the radio velocity method has the potential to discover planets just as, as small if they're orbiting very low mass stars. Uh, so far, we haven't been able to do that. Um, so far, the radio velocity method is only being able to get down to about one Earth mass. Uh, but it's possible that uh, some of the new technology that radio velocity observers are developing will be able to get to even smaller um, planets. But um, I would certainly say for the foreseeable future, uh, the transit method is going to be the best at finding really small planets. All right, the next question is to describe the three planets that we were, that have been discovered, that uh, we're so excited about. So, um, right, so there, there's three planets. They're what we would call super-Earths. Super-Earths are planets that are more massive than the Earth. They are, these, as I mentioned, I think a little, a little earlier, these planets have masses between about 2 and 10 Earth masses. And that upper mass range is really important because if they get a much beyond 10 Earth masses, we don't expect them to be gas, or ex excuse me, we don't expect them to be rocky planets anymore. We expect them to be gas giants. And so we really need to have these planets to be low mass so that we can expect them to be rocky and therefore potentially host life because most astrobiologists think that you need to have a rocky surface to support life on your surf on your surface. So these three planets, uh, as I said, they are in the habitable zone. One of them lo lives pretty close to the inner edge of the habitable zone, um, but it actually is getting just about the same amount of, of energy as the Earth does today. Uh, so uh, you know the Earth is is quite close to the inner edge of its habitable zone. So this inner planet, planet C. Uh, looks to be our, our best bet at sort of like an Earth-like twin in terms of, of radiation. Uh, there are two planets farther out in the habitable zone. Um, they are probably a little bit colder, although not necessarily. It certainly depends what the atmospheres of these planets are like. Uh, they could, if they have large amounts of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide or methane, they are likely to have a lot of, excuse me, I've lost my screen for a minute, they are likely to have a, uh, a lot of uh, they are likely to have a warm surface too, but they will need 
they will need a lot of these greenhouse gases to be habitable. So, you know, these planets, they, uh, they could very well be have, they could all very well just be just like the Earth in terms of surface temperatures. But there's one important caveat to that, and that is that we expect all of these planets to be tidally locked. And that means that their rotation rate has been slowed significantly by gravity. And in particular, because these orbits of these planets are circular, or at least very close to circular, uh, tidal locking will imply that these planets are uh, rotating in a synchronous sense. And that means that they present only one, s one hemisphere towards the star at all times. It's uh, exactly analogous to our moon, which only presents one side to the Earth. So these planets will have one side that is in permanent daylight and one side that is in permanent night time. And the, uh, this, this is actually not terrible for life. I mean, it might, it's certainly a different kind of barrier than the, the ones that we have on Earth. But what we, what we know now is that should these atmospheres be about half the mass of the Earth's atmosphere or larger, then you can actually transport that energy from the day side to the night side quite effectively. And so that will s smooth out this temperature gradient that might otherwise develop on these planets. So these planets, uh, although they're tidally locked, they do not, that does not preclude habitability, but it is certainly a very different kind of world than our Earth. Uh, so beyond that, there's not a lot more we can say about these planets. They are, they're going to be mysterious for a little while unless we can observe them through other methods. But we know that they are on approximately circular orbits. We suspect they are tidally locked. The, the outermost planet in the habitable zone might not be, but um, probably is. And so that's basically what we know. Now, I don't want to just limit this discussion to these three planets that are in the habitable zone, because there are likely two more that are beyond the reaches of the habitable zone, but are in a region where we think that maybe, just maybe, they might be habitable if they have some of the right conditions. So there is um, a planet on the very outer edge of what might be considered habitable. Um, and that's sort of when you really push these models of habitability to their extreme, you can actually get one of these planets you know, to be potentially habitable, but you know, probably very cold. Um, it's really hard to imagine how you can not have that planet to be right on the edge of being a complete ice ball. And then there's another planet that is at the inner edge of the, well, what we might consider habitable. That planet is barely detected. Um, it's probably, you know, I would, we really hedged our bets in the paper on that one. It's, it's not obvious that it's there, but there is pretty strong evidence that it's there. Uh, and that planet is, you know, very hot, although it could be habitable if it has, you know, very reflective clouds or perhaps if it has a very small amount of water content. So there's actually the potential that there are five habitable planets in this system. So that's sort of a, a brief overview of these planets and uh, you know some of their features they're certainly going to be different from the earth but they uh, they they could still be habitable we don't see any reason why we think that they can't support life at this point all right moving on next question is how did i get involved with exoplanet detection uh, so for a long time i was just a theorist i uh, mainly worked on the orbital dynamics like i said uh, it wasn't really until I started to work on how tides affect planets that I started thinking about uh, detection of exoplanets. Uh, when I came to the University of Washington to start to start my postdoc here in astrobiology, I got working with Eric Abel, who is a professor here, who uh, is heavily involved in transit detections. And so I've been involved in some ground-based transit studies that have been based here out of the University of Washington. Um, and, you know, my interest there was not only just in discovering them, but also in trying to apply my knowledge of tidal theory of how the, the tidal effects from the star can affect the planet, how they can change their orbits, things like that. And so that was kind of what led me to start thinking about uh, exoplanet detections. And um, with this discovery, um, I was not really heavily involved in their detection. Uh, instead, I was actually brought on board after their discovery by the first authors of this paper to help in the interpretation of both their orbital dynamics and their potential habitability. And so the next question is, can I describe the next generation of exoplanet detectors? Sure, I can give that a shot. Um, so there's a few different ways that this is going. Um, so 
from the ground, from the radial velocity approach, which is how these planets were discovered, then I think the next big step forward will be actually to go into looking at infrared detectors. So most of the ways that, most, most of the detectors that are used today are in the optical, so visible light that we, our own eyes, use. And that's great for looking at stars that are like the, the sun. They have a peak brightness in the optical, so designing detectors that maximize that efficiency of, of matching it up with the uh, spectrum of these stars is ideal. But as we go to lower mass stars, like Gliese 667c, these stars are brightest in the infrared. And so therefore, it would be best to build your detectors to match up to that spectrum. There's a problem, though, in that the Earth's atmosphere also emits quite a bit in the infrared. <laughs> and so that is a, a source of noise that has to be contended with. But nonetheless, I think as we go forward towards trying to find these planets around lower mass stars, you know, we're going to be wanting to look for infrared detectors. Um, beyond that, you know, there are always people trying to improve transit methods. Um, there's going to be a great mission that NASA is going to launch called TESS, which is going to be like Kepler, but it's going to look through the entire sky. So that's sort of the next big, I think, breakthrough for transits will be when the, when the TESS, message, TESS, TESS mission launches in 2017. All right, the next question is, where is Gliese 667c and how far is it? Right, I, I think I left these bits of information out. So Gliese 667c is 22 light years from the Earth. That's about 200 trillion kilometers. And it is located in the constellation Scorpio. So it's actually a pretty easy star to spot, or at least, I maybe I shouldn't say spot, but to look where it is. <laughs> it's very faint, uh, but you can at least know where it is. It is right in front of the stinger in Scorpio. So this is visible today in, in July in the Northern Hemisphere and in the Southern Hemisphere for that matter. It's a constellation right on the equator. So if you go out tonight and you look for Scorpio, it's an easy constellation to spot and then look directly in front of it, the Stinger, um, just a few degrees in front of it is the Gliese 667 system. So as I think I mentioned early on, this uh, it's a triple star system. Uh, Gliese 667c is the lowest mass companion there are two other stars that are about 70 or 75% the mass of the Earth, or excuse me, 75% of the mass of the Sun. Um, they are still fairly faint though. This is uh, a star that you would really have to know what you're looking for. You would have to, you know, be in a very dark site and kind of let your eyes adjust all night if you were to try and see it with your naked eye. But it's something that would be very trivial to see with um, binoculars or, or a telescope. So. Go out and look for it. It's, it's pretty fascinating, I think, to go out and look and, you know, you don't necessarily see that star, but you can know that you're looking in the direction of three habitable planets, or three potentially habitable planets orbiting a single star. All right, the next question. How old are these planets estimated to be, given that they are tidally locked? Yeah, that's a great question, and tidal locking does take time, and we don't really know the age of this system very well. We know that this the star is old, <laughs> and what we mean by that is that it's probably between 2 and 10 giga years old, 2 and 10 billion years old. Uh, it's really, really challenging to measure the ages of stars, and this is you know, really going to be a problem as we move forward trying to characterize the habitability of these stars and of these planets, because you know, it really matters. We, you know, we know that life on Earth took a long time to evolve, and it went through various stages, and we'd like to have some guide as to what life might be like on these planets. So I th we sort of settled on, you know, probably the, s the stars are somewhere in the neighborhood of six billion years old. Um, but again, that's six plus or minus four. So it's, it's not really obvious. But um, for most of the, for most of the re reasonable ages that you could come up with for this system, these planets will be tidally locked for any sort of initial conditions that are plausible. Um, the only exception to that is Planet D, which is very much at the outer edge of the potential for habitability. This is this planet that I mentioned is almost assuredly ice covered, but it kind of sort of maybe could be habitable. That one is the only one that has a chance of not being tidally locked, and only if you assume it started off with a very high obliquity, that is an axial tilt, sort of the Earth's obliquity is 23 and a half degrees, 
Um, it has to have a high obliquity to start as well as a very fast rotation period, maybe 10 hours or less to start. Those, those sorts of conditions will uh, resist the tidal locking process. Uh, so that's really the only, the only planet that looks to be, uh, have, be, have the power to escape the tidal locking. All right, the next question. How many transits need to be observed by the planets before an official discovery can be declared? So that's a, an interesting question in regards to this uh, discovery. Now, these planets were not discovered via, via transit, so that doesn't really apply here. I think if, if they just had, if we were able to see just one transit, then we, and it happened at a time when we thought it would be there because it would be consistent with the radial velocity orbits, then we would be able, I think, to say with high confidence that we did, in fact, observe the transit. Uh, but that's, this is a special case for, for that sort of discovery because we already know the planets are there from radial velocity, so we already have a good description of their orbits. Uh, for just trying to discover a, a planet via transit, you do need at least three transits because you want to be able to see the periodicity that is uh, one of the hallmarks of orbital motion. So you need to have the first two just in order to s confirm that the first one you saw was not just some sort of fluke or some sort of weird astrophysical issue, whether it be a star spot or who knows what it might have been. And then you need that third transit in order to confirm you're seeing, seeing a periodic signal. So really you need, so to just discover a planet, you need to have three transits. All right, back to the next generation of exoplanet detection missions. Which one do I think will be the most likely to be funded? Oh, well, that's certainly a loaded question. Um, well, so TESS has been funded, so beyond that, I really don't have a good sense of what's going to be funded. I think, you know, we've obviously spent a lot of effort, and, and I guess it depends on what, what um, you know, funding agency you're thinking about, whether it be NASA or ESA. Those are really the only two uh, agencies that are really thinking about funding these missions. Um, you know, I really don't know what it's going to be. You know, we, we're, we're in the, the process of discovering these exoplanets. Um, I would suspect that the next mission beyond TESS will be one of these missions that does more of a characterization of the atmosphere kind of, uh, of, of a mission. Something that's really going to be aimed at trying to detect the molecules in the atmosphere. I think that's probably where NASA would go next, but what do I know? All right, next is, how different is Gliese 667c from the sun? Can we expect the planets to be also silicate rich? Aha, so um, as I think I mentioned, Gliese 667c is about a third the mass of the sun. Um, it's also about a third the radius of the sun. So it is certainly quite a bit smaller. Its uh, luminosity is about 1% that of the sun. So it's a much dimmer star than our sun and its temperature is um, around 3200 degrees Kelvin, I believe, somewhere around there, 3000 to 3500. Um, so it's about 2000 degrees cooler than our sun. Um, so it emits most of its light uh, in the infrared. So uh, it is certainly a different kind of star than our sun. Um, we do know that it's a very quiet star, and by quiet, I mean that in the astrophysical way, um, it's not got a lot of, you know, motion on the surface, it's, uh, it's not really cover, covered in star spots and, and things like that. It's a, it's a relatively calm star. So from that perspective, that's also good. We don't want to see these planets that are getting completely bombarded with you know, uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares. This is uh, one of the big concerns for planets around M dwarfs. That doesn't look like it's going to be too much of a problem today for these stars. I guess I should have mentioned, you know, these, these stars are all about uh, five to ten times closer to their star than, than, than the Earth is to our sun. So they're a lot closer to their, their host star. So that's why we worry about some of this activity that might be ongoing on the surface of the star. So um, it's certainly a different kind of star. Um, moving on to your next question, can we also expect the planets to be silicate rich? That's a great question that I hope will be addressed by uh, by theorists here in the future. My suspicion is that these planets actually formed farther away from their star than they are found today, beyond the so-called snow line or ice line, 
and that's just because uh, this planetary system is very packed. There are a, there is a lot of mass in and around this habitable zone, and we know from studies uh, that have been done in the past by people like Sean Raymond that uh, it's really hard to form planets, big planets, super Earths in the habitable zones of M dwarfs, just from local material. And the reason is just that we expect the the masses of these disks from which the planets would form to be smaller than to be smaller than that which our solar system formed from, because the the stellar mass is smaller. Now there's a huge range there. Uh, you know there's a, quite a diversity of, of, of protoplanetary disks as we call them around M dwarf stars around these low mass stars, but probably they are of lower mass than for sun-like stars. Now that's okay because you know there's a lot of mass in total in the in the disk and so if we can sort of smash all that mass together we can still form these planets but what that means is that we probably have a lot of ices and volatiles in these planets so these are great candidates for water worlds they're probably formed with a lot of, of icy material and before the gas dissipated out of the disk they then migrated from farther out from these colder regions of the disk and were parked basically in the in the habitable zone just because the uh, the disk dissipated at that point or for some other reason you know it's hard to say for sure at this point what what exactly caused these planets to stop there but um, I don't know if they're going to be silicate rich uh, you know there's a lot of there's a lot of processes that happen during the planet formation process but I think what we could say is that these are probably volatile rich If I could design my own mission, what would I do? Well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, you know, I really miss the SIM mission, the Space Interferometry mission. I thought that was a great, uh, a great mission because that was going to find the orbits and masses of nearby terrestrial planets. Uh, I would really like to know where the planets are near the Earth. Um, I think that there's a few reasons for that. When they're near the Earth, we have a better chance of discovering them. It's easier to find smaller objects that are nearer to the Earth, nearer to our Sun. Um, and yeah, I think that before we move on to the process of actually trying to characterize the orbits of, or excuse me, the atmospheres of these planets, it would really be nice to know what's out there. What what are our targets? Yeah, the, 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 the discovery of molecules in the atmosphere of a terrestrial planet is an extremely challenging endeavor. Uh, if the James Webb Space Telescope flies and they can look at one of these nearby planets' atmospheres, it's going to take nearly the entire mission in order to measure a single planet's atmosphere. So it is really a hard proposition to look at these, these terrestrial planet atmospheres from from the Earth, or I really, I should say, from the Earth's orbit. So it's a it's a costly endeavor, and so it'd be nice to sort of know what are the nearby planets, so that we can pick that one that looks the best, so we don't waste our time. You know, we the Gliese six six seven C might be might be it, but you know, it'd be nice to know what the other ones are around there. So the SIM mission was the space interferometry mission. It was uh, proposed during the last decade, but unfortunately, it was canceled. Um, so, but I would really like to see a mission that was designed to find all of the nearby terrestrial planets. And by nearby, I would say sort of within 50 light years or so, maybe 100 light years. All right, what are some of your other interesting and exciting discoveries? <laughs> well, I can tell you what I think. <laughs> um, so I think sort of early on, some of the, the things that got me really excited was um, when I uh, predicted uh, the existence of some planets uh, in, exo, in, in some exoplanetary systems, and they were subsequently discovered. Um, you know, I predicted that there would be a planet around a star called HD 74156, um, along with Sean Raymond. And uh, we said, you know, look right here, this planet, there, you'll find a planet with this mass and this orbit. And about four or five years later, somebody found it there. And it was the first time uh, a planet had been predicted and then discovered since Neptune. Um, so I thought that was certainly a very exciting uh, discovery to be a part of. Um, to, to tell the other side of the story, there's been some speculation that maybe that planet doesn't exist, so there's been some evidence to suggest that it's not there. It's, it's, if it is there, it's sort of right at the detection limit. 
but certainly that was exciting to at least think that that's been there and there's been other cases since then where we think we've found planets where uh, Sean and I thought they would be so that was really exciting um, another uh, result that I was really excited to be a part of was the discovery that there are two planets uh, orbiting Epsilon Andromeda that do not orbit in the same plane so in our solar system all the planets orbit in the same roughly in the same plane they're all basically in a disk um, however, in Upsilon Andromeda, the orbital planes are inclined by 30 degrees. Uh, so that's very different from what we see in our solar system. And that required a, a huge amount of data and a huge amount of effort to, uh, to discover that. It was a combination of this radial velocity method that we used to discover Gliese 667c, as well as uh, astrometry, which is something I mentioned earlier, um, astrometry from the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and so that, I think, was really exciting to just see that you know, these exoplanets, they just continue to surprise us. You know, we first, we found hot Jupiters. Uh, we found the, um, he has these very eccentric orbits. And then now we find that planets don't even have to orbit in the same plane. Uh, so that was the first time that that had been discovered in an exoplanetary system. So that was, that was also a really fun discovery to be a part of. All right. Ha ha ha. Do I prefer forehand or backhand when I huck a disc? Well, that is a fantastic question. I am strictly a forehander. I, you know, I, I definitely, I, you know, if you ever have to guard me in an ultimate game, don't guard my backhand, because I'm not going to throw it. <laughs> All right, next question. When did you find time to write a book? Well, I didn't really write a book. Um, so this, this is a question from Sanjoy, who's asking about a book, which I assume he's referring to called The Formation and Evolution of Exoplanets. And uh, that is a book I edited. Um, now, I did write a chapter in that book, um, but yeah, that, was, uh, that did take a little bit of time to, to do that. I had to uh, go through you know, a, lot of, a lot of different people's work. I was a, it's a book that's aimed at uh, sort of upper level undergrad, or excuse me, upper level graduate students and early postdocs. So uh, it was certainly a pretty high level book, but you know, it, was a, it was a lot of fun to go through that. Uh, it was sort of a, it's a nice, I think, snapshot of uh, the exoplanet community and the exoplanet science in about 2009. All right, next up is how do scientists detect the rotation direction of stars? Well, that is a really hard thing to do. So we can get a handle on sort of a minimum level of the rotational velocity of stars, just how fast are they spinning, but we don't necessarily know if that is the actual direction. Now, what we can sometimes do is we can measure the difference between the orbital, excuse me, the orbital, orbital plane of a planet and the rotational axis of its star. That's only possible when they transit. Uh, now, if we are able to do, uh, or able to make astro-seismic measurements of a star, we can sometimes get a handle on the rotational direction of the, uh, or the rotational axis of the, the star. Now, astroseismology is, is something that has not that well known, but I think it's going to be something that we're going to really be exploring a lot in the future because it's really proving to be a valuable tool uh, from the Kepler mission. So astroseismology is basically watching the pulsations of a star. They, the stars actually vibrate uh, a little bit, and that's just due to the interaction of the gravitational compression uh, and the nuclear explosion going on in the interior. And so if you can mod model these pulsations and, and watch these pulsations, you can actually get a very good handle on what's going on in the interior of these stars. And that can get you a handle on then how you measure the rotation direction of stars. But that's a really challenging kind of observation to make, and so it's not something that we know very well. All right. Uh, next is, how did I choose astrobiology as a career? <laughs> well, it was certainly not something I had thought about going into graduate school. You know, I wanted to be an astronomer pretty much my whole life. Uh, so I just happened to choose coming to the University of Washington for, for graduate school the same year that their astrobiology program started. That was in 1998. Um, you know, I didn't even know that the program existed when I showed up here. And I, at the time, I didn't even think I wanted to work on planets or astrobiology or anything at all. I wanted to work on, you know, high energy astrophysics, things like black holes and supernovae. But uh, the year I started here was the year they discovered three planets orbiting Upsilon Andromeda. 
uh, and I thought that was really fascinating and so I started working with my PhD advisor Tom Quinn and uh, looking into the orbital dynamics of that system and as I started to work on those exoplanets uh, I got more aware of the astrobiology program that was here and so I started sitting in on some of the classes I started sitting in on some of the lectures in astrobiology and I found it fascinating I think you know it is a fascinating topic to think about just how does life form and evolve in the universe and so I after I I took those courses and I, I, I didn't get an astrobiology degree or certificate here but um, when I went on to the uh, planetary sciences department at the University of Arizona I was again exposed to a lot more of of uh, this sort of research in our solar system my postdoctoral postdoctoral advisor there was Richard Greenberg who has done a lot of great work on the astrobiology astrobiological relevance of Europa and so I was continuing to be exposed to astrobiology there. There was also an astrobiology program at Arizona while I was there. But I would say the real breakthrough for me came when I started working on the tidal evolution of exoplanets. And at first we started working on the, uh, the, the hot Jupiters, these you know, very large Jupiter-like planets that orbit close to their star. And uh, it occurred to me when we were working on those that, you know, hey, you know, this applies a lot to uh, the terrestrial planets and in fact you know the, the effect should be much greater on terrestrial exoplanets because they they are much more uh, receptive to tidal processes and so um, it was sort of towards the end of my postdoc there at Arizona when I started making these connections to how I could use my orbital dynamics background to apply to habitability questions that I, I really realized that I found sort of what I wanted to do with my career um, and so it was sort of a, a very long, slow process, but I think, you know, in the end it was really, really fascinating to sort of look back on that and see that, you know, I kind of had, I was lucky enough to have some of the background for it because I had started here at the University of Washington where they did have the program. And then once I w had moved on and I, I discovered some new avenues of research that I could connect back to the astrobiology questions, um, that was that really gave me the background as well as the motivation to start pursuing astrobiology as a career. All right, uh, the next question. With all these discoveries of exoplanets close to their star, what does this apply about habitability in your opinion, in my opinion? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that, Julia, but uh, what I will say is that I think that, you know, there is a huge diversity of, of planets out there. Uh, you know, we can't necessarily use our solar system as sort of the template for what planets are going to be like and what the total possibility of planets are out there. So, you know, we just have to try and use uh, what we know in our solar system and, and try and extrapolate from there to think about what these planets might be like and of course using the laws of physics. I like to think about our solar system as providing something that I call solar system truth as opposed to ground truth when we think about the exoplanets. You know, we have to try and base our, our models of these exoplanets in our solar system, but we also have to always be aware that there's going to be a huge diversity of, of exoplanets out there and that they're always going to surprise us. And, you know, I mean, you know, there's going to be these carbon planets out there and, you know, reducing mantles and things like that that are really going to be surprising. And, you know, what I hope that these close-in planets might do is at least you know, they're going to be more likely to transit. We're going to be able to characterize them better. Maybe we will be able to use those planets, which we can maybe measure more of their properties to understand what the planets in the habitable zone might be like. All right, exomoons. All right, I, I assume the question there is, what do I think about exomoons? And uh, exomoons are cool. Um, I wrote a paper on that earlier this year with my colleague Renee Heller. Um, and we looked at just sort of what does it really take for an exomoon to be habitable and there's a whole lot of issues there they can actually get a lot more energy than a planet and so it's possible that these exomoons can support life but they just have different si sorts of requirements than the exoplanets uh, you know the biggest challenge I think with the exomoons is detecting them Kepler could have discovered them, and maybe we still will find them in the Kepler database. It would have been really great if Kepler had survived another four years like it was supposed to, and we would have been able to maybe pull out the signal of an exomoon uh, out of the, the Kepler data. It might still happen, um, but you know, 
It's also, a lot of the theory on the formation of exomoons suggests that forming something the size of the Earth or Mars around a Jupiter-sized planet is gonna be really challenging. Now that's also based quite a bit on our solar system. So it might be that in different kinds of uh, planetary systems, uh, you know, you can get different moons to form. But, you know, at this point, we don't know. Um, they have a lot of different possibilities. Uh, as far as exomoons in the Gliese 667c system, uh, they're probably not actually very likely. The same physical process that tidally locks the planets um, will also destroy the exomoons. Uh, they will either evolve away from the, uh, the planet and be lost into space, or they will collide with the, the planet. Now, that does depend on the size of the moon and the initial conditions, and certainly, you know, as you go farther out of the habitable zone, there might be some exomoons. There, they'll be more likely. Um, but right now, you know, I think exomoons, it's a, it's a new class of object that we can imagine, but we haven't discovered yet. So I think they're, they're, they're a lot of fun to think about, and there's a lot of, they have a lot of different properties than, than exoplanets. And so, I, I, you know, I've recently seen there's been a, a, pr a pretty big explosion in research on exomoons. I think people are, are, are hoping that they get discovered soon. And then let's see here. So the next question it looks like it's a follow-up. Uh, do I think that moons are possible around the giant, around the planets of Gliese 667c? And the presence of a moon has been argued as having a big role in maintaining habitability of Earths to over time. Right. So I answered the first part of that question. Um, right. So the second point is very interesting. It has been argued that the Earth stabilizes our climate, but as far as I can tell, that's really just conjecture. Uh, there was a There was a a model presented about 20 years ago by Jacques Lascar, uh, where he showed that the moon could stabilize the Earth's a rotational axis, and he argued, without proof, that that would be that's why the Earth is habitable. More recently, uh, a group led by Jack Lassauer and Jason Barnes revisited that result and found that although the moon does stabilize the Earth, if you actually do the calculations more directly and worry about things over billions of years, you don't really see a lot of orbital variation, or excuse me, or rotational variation on the Earth. So it's not really even clear that the Moon does stabilize the Earth's axis to a significant degree. But more generally, I don't really know why we need to stabilize the climate to such a strong degree. You know, we see evolution on Earth is driven by environmental change, or at least it can be. And so, you can imagine that maybe with more rotational variation, you might in fact get planets that evolve life or maybe intelligent life more quickly. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe the moon actually hurts <laughs> the development of life on Earth. Now, that's just as big a conjecture as saying that the moon helps it. Um, but yeah, I think this is something that uh, some colleagues and I are working on actively right now is to try and understand exactly how moons affect the habitability of, of planets. And what we're actually finding is that you, know, you can increase the uh, the habitable zone width if you don't have a moon because you this uh, movement of the rotational axis of the uh, the planet actually can melt um, polar caps and equatorial ice belts that might form and so you deplete the reservoir of ice that can sort of uh, serve as sort of the, the base for the ice to uh, sort of move out and cover an entire planet but that's that's work in progress uh, hopefully you know you can we'll see that soon so moons are fascinating they do a lot of things and I think you know, it's not clear that they're good or bad, they just, they're just another aspect of a planet when you think about its potential habitability. All right, next is, can I explain the diamond planet idea? Sure. So the diamond planet idea is that in, for some planets, you would expect them to be carbon rich. And this just has to do with the fact that what is the ratio of carbon to oxygen in um, a protoplanetary disk? Um, so if the ratio is such that there's, let's see, I have to get this right here, I have to think about this for a second. You know, basically, if all the oxygen bonds with the hydrogen, you get left with carbon. And so the carbon is going to be able to bond with things, things like silicates, and you're gonna get um, carbides and these sort of, basically these carbon-based molecules, the carbon is going to be the dominant um, sort of a source of, the dominant solid in the uh, in the planet, and so you know if you have a, a big carbon planet, um, it's going to have a lot of pressure on it, and that's going to 
you know, compress and form diamonds. Now, who knows if that's really the case, but um, the, the basic idea is, is that the, uh, the ratios of carbon to oxygen in different planets, or excuse me, different protoplanetary disks can lead to um, a different composition in the, uh, the planets, and you might get like silicon carbide in, uh, in a planet instead of silicon, uh, silicon oxides. And so, you know, that might produce these carbon planets, which is probably a better way to describe it than a diamond planet. I don't really know that we understand, you know, how the, the pressure and temperatures of these carbon planets are going to behave and evolve. But at least, uh, you know, that's really where that comes from, is just that we expect that there are some stars where we see the carbon to, oxi carbon to oxygen ratio is such that we would expect these planets to be dominated by, by carbon instead of silicates. All right, what have been some of the most interesting or weird exoplanet discoveries? Well, I think all of them. <laughs> um, you know, so, boy, uh, you know, just all along the, the history of exoplanets, there's been interesting and weird discoveries. I mean, the first exoplanet discovered was not expected to be there. Uh, 51 Pegasus uh, is a hot Jupiter orbiting a sun-like star. Nobody but nobody thought that those planets would exist uh, in, our, in, our, in our galaxy. So that was a huge uh, question right off the bat. Then we started finding these eccentric planets, planets on eccentric orbits. Um, you know, and then as I, I've said, you know, discovering, you know, planets on inclined orbits. One one planet that I think was really cool that was recently discovered is actually a planet that, uh, excuse me, orbits a star that we think is belongs to a galaxy that was recently uh, consumed by the Milky Way. It's part of a, a stream of stars in our galaxy that we think is basically a, a galaxy that's being ripped apart. So it's sort of this extra galactic exoplanet. So, um, you know, there's, there's a ton of cool stuff out there. It's also interesting to find these planets that um, orbit in the opposite sense around their star than the star rotates, these so-called retrograde planets. Um, you know, there's planets that are on extremely eccentric orbits that bring them very close into their host star and you can actually watch the weather on these planets with the Spitzer Space Telescope. You can see them get shock heated as they pass very close to their star and they get heated up to thousands of degrees. <clears throat> so, you know, I, I, there's, there's so many out there that are, that are weird. Um, I don't, you know, that's just a, an incomplete list for sure. Aha. Any last words of wisdom? Well, you know, you don't want to talk to me about wisdom. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't know that I have too much more to say. These are uh, great, great questions that you guys have all had. I, I think that, you know, what I find really exciting about this time is that, you know, we're, we're, we, I think we finally hit uh, the point in exoplanetary science where we are going to be finding the potentially habitable planets. This year, I think, will go down. 2013 is the year when we really started to find the, the habitable planets. Um, you know, just a few months ago, uh, the Kepler Space Telescope found a system with two planets in its habitable zone that were looked to be super Earths. You know, now we found one with three. You know, we're finding planets around Alpha Centauri, not in the habitable zone, but we're finding them around our closest star. I think we're just at the tip of this iceberg where we're we're going to find that the the uh, the universe and our galaxy is really just full of habitable planets, and so, you know, I, I, I hope that's the case. Yeah, you know, certainly when people have extrapolated from the Kepler data, that's what we see. And so, you know, hopefully that is the case and that this is really just, we're turning that faucet from just a little drip, drip, drip of habitable planets to just full blown, and we're just gonna start to see a huge rush of, of habitable planets um, this year. So, you know, people are working hard on this, and hopefully we'll see that in the future. All right, I guess uh, we're getting done here, so maybe I'll just try and ask, answer this one last question. I heard news of the pla there are planets that are less dense than styrofoam, and yeah, that's true. We are finding some really, really puffy planets out there. That's another one of these weird, weird uh, planets. You know, we we're able in some cases when we can measure the planet's mass through radial velocity and it measure its radius through transits, we can measure the density, and then we start to see these very you know, under dense kinds of planets, you know, so yeah, there's a lot of them out there. And then of course, we also see some gas giants out there that look like they have 80 to 100 Earth masses of rock in their interior. These are, these are definitely planets that challenge our, our planet formation models. So, 
yeah, and I think we're just going to keep finding more and more of these kinds of crazy planets. So. All right, well, thank you all for uh, your great questions, and uh, keep working on the astrobiology.